Immediately a voice begins to speak in a cinema. The sound apparatus takes precedence over the camera, thereby doing violence to natural instincts. several extremely important functions. They provide a few moments during which the audience can withdraw from the real world before the picture itself starts. They give the viewer a few seconds to adjust himself to the dark room and the screen image. Around the year 1000, some 500 years before Montaigne wrote the first ever essay, a court lady for the empress of the 66th emperor of Japan, Emperor Ichijo, began to write down her thoughts, her observations and her poetry. Sei Shonagon was considered to have an excellent memory. Sometimes she simply wrote lists, like things that quicken the heart. Sparrows feeding their young, to pass a place where babies are playing, to sleep in a room where some fine incense has been burnt, to notice that one's elegant Chinese mirror has become a little cloudy, to see a gentleman stop his carriage before one's gate and instruct his attendants to announce his arrival, to wash one's hair, make one's toilet, and put on scented robes. Even if not a soul sees one, these preparations still produce an inner pleasure. It is night and one is expecting a visitor. Suddenly, one is startled by the sound of raindrops, which the wind blows against the shutters. What makes this revolutionary? The recording of fleeting thoughts of individual expression? When Montaigne pioneered the essay from the French to attempt, to weigh, to evaluate, his intention was to criticise, to reassess, to question, to be sceptical of all that which presents itself as universal. For Montaigne, scepticism was central in this pursuit because it underpins the impossibility of the universal being undeniably true. It allowed room for individual dissent, personal creativity, and the possibility that others might too be right and you wrong. To essay is to practice human frailty. But still, for hundreds of years, essays were rare. And even before they became popular, essayistic characteristics were visible in early cinema. This is the first photo. And this is it retouched. It was taken in 1826. 37 years after the French Revolution. This is the first film, recorded in 1888. It lasts two seconds. Mm -hmm. 
Alright, so here we are in front of the uh, elephants. Um, the cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's, that's cool. This is the first YouTube video. Soviet cinema pioneered many modern movie-making tropes. Ziga Vertov's groundbreaking Man with a Movie Camera was a radically subjective portrait of 1929 Moscow. It presented the city as fast, efficient and modern. But this film, is it an objective recording? A representation of reality in the 20s? Or is it a subjective, artistic expression of individuality? Much like, say, Shanagon and Montaigne's fleeting thoughts. The written essay didn't really come into its own until the 20th century. Newspapers rarely carried anything but short block print stories that provided the news dryly stock prices, events abroad, or political speeches, almost verbatim. Essays were viewed with contempt by many. In the 20th century, German critical theorists like Walter Benjamin and Theodore Adorno began to argue that the essay should be taken seriously. In German, the word wasn't even translatable. In 1910, the Hungarian philosopher George Lukacs wrote on the nature and form of the essay. In it, he argued that the essay was criticism as art. Ultraviolet rays refracted through a literary prism. For Lukacs, the essay was primarily a subjective endeavour, an artistic one. Philosopher Theodore Adorno, on the other hand, disputed the idea that the essay was primarily an art form. He argued that the aesthetic qualities of the essay, the flair, the subjectivity, the poetry, were merely formal, part of the form of the essay, but that its fundamental quality was truth, or at least its pursuit of or claim to truth. For Adorno, the essay was primarily an objective pursuit. Walter Benjamin argued that mechanical reproduction changed the work of art, Art designed to be reproduced was political. It could influence people, affect the masses. Through photography, the human eye loses its immemorial privilege. The mechanical eye of the photographic machine now sees in its place, and in certain aspects with more sureness. The photograph stands as at once the triumph and the grave of the eye. Many of these thinkers, now referred to as the Frankfurt School, were referenced heavily in video essays at the end of the century. In Persistence, for example, Daniel Eisenberg quotes Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history. The true picture of the past flits by. The past can be seized only as an image, which flashes up at the instant when it can be recognised and never seen again. For every, every image, image of the past, of the past that's, that's not, not recognised recognized by the present as one of its own concerns, concerns threatens to disappear, to disappear irretrievably. irretrievably. Um, what's the difference between writing an essay, an article and a script? Okay, the reader can change pace, slow down, speed up, pause to reflect all easily and intuitively when they're reading. I guess the viewer counts so much. Videos are usually watched without much adjustment. So the viewer must be able to absorb the information easier. So I should give the viewer a chance to reflect, to think about breaks, think about the complexity of what you're transmitting. Think about the overburden of stimuli, the music, the picture, the sound, the text. One of the most influential theorists of the documentary, Bill Nichols, has argued that there are different modes of documentary, 
and that they've developed linearly as a genealogy. They are the poetic mode, highly subjective, artistic, usually no narrative, no argument. Eisenstein's man with a movie camera being the archetypal example. The expository mode moved towards objectivity, the transmission of information, narrative, rhetoric. The participatory mode led the filmmaker to interact with the participants. The filmmaker's voice is heard as he creates or narrates the documentary. The observational mode arose under the influence of lighter equipment, tripods, cameras, the possibility of a fly-on-the-wall style. Cinema verite, just observe. The reflexive mode is typified by the filmmaker reflecting on the creation process, seeing the development of the piece itself as it's produced. We might see the equipment, the cameras, or we might hear something about the thought process, the story changing as it's filmed. And the performative mode is highly participatory, with lots of inclusion of the filmmaker, but in a way in which the filmmaker puts his own alter mark on the process, on the film, on the outcome. These films are usually deeply personal. The filmmaker has a stake in the film. Hmm. What mode do I want to write in? Poetic, hopefully. But mainly expository, I suppose. This needs to be informative. Write that down. This needs to be informative. The theory of the novel should be a novel. Schlegel. Scholar Stella Bruzzi criticises Nichols' modes. She argues that Nichols takes a selective and exclusive sample of films to create an inflexible structuralist family tree. One that, on reflection, constrains films in categories and, importantly, doesn't hold up to criticism anyway. Bruzzi argues that documentaries are neither primarily objective nor subjective, but somewhere between the two, a synthesis of the two. She writes, Documentary will never be reality, nor will it erase or invalidate that reality by being representational. Documentary is predicated upon a dialectical relationship between aspiration and potential, that the text itself reveals the tensions between the documentary pursuit of the most authentic mode of factual representation and the impossibility of this aim. She builds on Judith Butler's concept of performativity, that we subjectively perform a world into existence. Take S. for Shub's 1927 Fall of the Romanov Dynasty. Shub found 60,000 metres of home film in the private collection of Tsar Nicholas II, a film that's both objective, of a touchable, material, undeniable reality, and inherently pro Tsarist, shot from the Tsar's subjective position. But Shub also reworks the footage into a pro Bolshevik film. So you can take something real and apply an idea, turn it into something ideological. And another point arises from this. The direct experience, record, memory, photons hitting the lens, the vibration of the microphone is never enough. To understand it fully, because man is the measure of all things, we must understand the narrative, the story, the context, the subjective human experience that absorbed it and threw it forward. This is what performativity means. We take something and we choose to carry it into the future, consciously or not. Every action we undertake is a creation of some kind. In the 60s, Emil D'Antonio pioneered a style that reflected Shubbs. Like Shubb, D'Antonio cuts together archival footage into a compilation film to tell his own story. As a Marxist, D'Antonio made films critical of figures like McCarthy and Nixon. He called the style a kind of collage junk idea I got from my painter's friends. The final scenes of Point of Order, a film about Senator McCarthy, shows McCarthy giving a long speech while those in the room pack their bags and leave. The scene is a fiction, 
Antonio uses a number of different pre-existing archival shots, but figuratively reflects the political establishment turning their back on McCarthy. Footage, then, in video essays, can be used metaphorically, figuratively, without losing any of its claim to some kind of truthfulness, of objectivity. The order that D'Antonio shows is not real, but then, as soon as you apply cuts to any documentary, as soon as you edit, the claim to any representation of an objective reality falls to the cutting room floor. We can also see this in Atomic Cafe, another landmark film documenting, with archival footage, the Cold War and the nuclear arms race. The film includes this government scene uninterrupted. shells to crawl into like Bert the turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. Paul and Patty know this. No matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. Duck and cover. a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. And cover. That's the first thing to do. Duck and cover. And cover. First, you duck. duck. And then, you cover. You duck and duck. cover tight. And duck cover. and cover under the table. Duck. It's a bomb. And duck, and cover. Cover. duck and 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 cover. But follows it with this. Question. Uh, yes? How far do you have to be from the blast to live through it? Well, let's take a 20 megaton surface burst. You would have a good chance of surviving if you were more than 12 miles from the point of detonation. A bomb equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT would cause an intense fire called a firestorm in an area of about 2,000 square miles around the center of the blast. And in such an area, it would be futile, desperately futile, to construct what are called fallout shelters. This choice of cut has the effect of mocking the US government's warning to duck and cover in the event of a nuclear blast. Bruzy uses these examples to make a simple point. She takes issue with the central tenet of much theoretical writing on documentary, namely that a successful documentary is contingent upon representing the truth at its core as objectively as possible. Documentary film is traditionally perceived to be the hybrid offspring of a perennial struggle between the forces of objectivity, represented by the documents or facts that underpin it, and the forces of subjectivity, that is the translation of those facts into representational form. Video essays have made this clearer than ever. With their low financial bar to entry, their accessibility, the ability to express to large numbers of people, the format reels with latent democratic potential, if only utilised in the correct way. Never before have so many been able to express their views to so many others. The people who take their views and try to duplicate them, try to convince as many people as possible to replicate them themselves, they take a part of their history, a part of their memory, and throw it forward. History and memory are intimately connected, two sides of the same coin. History is memory transcribed. Memory is that which we take from the past to use for the future. 
and collective memory is shaped by those who collect it. Collective memory can be used and misused. History, the total textual, visual and audio material of the past, is happening everywhere, right now, in its entirety. It's the job of the individual to reconfigure it in both the subjective and personal sense, particular to his or her place in the world, and the universal and ethical sense, their social place in the world. We are constructed of, we absorb and we construct history, and we catapult it along with our bodies into the future. History is posterity. Voiceover, narration, voiceover, narration. Is this too didactic? Robert Drew said that words supplied from outside cannot make a film soar. Narration is what you do when you fail. Narration is what you do when you fail. Narration suggests, as exemplified by its usually masculine, middle-upper-class, preachy, paternalistic, Simon Shammer-like qualities, that there's a single, authoritative way of interpreting the world and its events. In film theory, for many, narration equals bad. It's bound up in Nichols' expository mode, an older way of making documentaries. The film, according to realists, should show the truth. The lens captures the truth. Any reversion to the filmmaker's thoughts and voice are an intrusion of his or her subjectivity, a distortion of the facts. Show, don't tell. But as we've seen, all films are a synthesis of the objective and the subjective. That's unavoidable. Is it not more of a sin to try and hide this? To ignore the cuts, the lengths, the angles, the timings, the choices. To attempt to make it appear as if the director is a ghost. Should the filmmaker not defend himself? At what point is a documentary not a documentary? At what point is it an essay, a home movie, a travel log? For video essayist Ursula Byman, Chris Marker's 1983 Sans Soleil marks the emergence of a post-structuralist, cinematographic, cinemata, cinematographic, cinematography, cinematographic, cinematographic, the emergence of a post-structuralist, cinematographic practice defined as film essays. She defines film essays as somewhere between documentary video and video art. She says, for a documentary, they are seen as too experimental, self-reflexive and subjective. And for an art video, they stand out for being socially involved or explicitly political. Even before the internet took off, the 90s, with the proliferation of cheaper cameras and equipment, saw an explosion of video essays by artists primarily displayed in galleries. This might be the moment that documentary, essay and art imploded into one. Sans Soleil's female narrator is relaying us information from a series of letters from the fictional cameraman, Sandor Krasner. The relationship is ambiguous, the narration rambling, but the theme, loosely, is a reflection on travel and memory. He spoke to me of Seishanagan a lady-in-waiting to Princess Sadako at the beginning of the 11th century, in the Heian period. Do we ever know where history is really made? Rulers ruled and used complicated strategies to fight one another. Real power was in the hands of a family of hereditary regents. The Empress Court had become nothing more than a place of intrigues and intellectual games. But by learning to draw a sort of melancholy comfort from the contemplation of the tiniest things, the small group of idlers left a mark on Japanese sensibility, much deeper than the mediocre thundering of the politicians. Shonagan had a passion for lists, the list of elegant things, distressing things, or even of things not worth doing. One day she got the idea of drawing up a list of 
things that quicken the heart. Not a bad criterion, I realize when I'm filming. I bow to the economic miracle, but what I want to show you are the neighborhood celebrations. The Proustian cameraman makes observations about his travels, about culture, history, and jumps between topics depending on the whims of his own memory. Is the voice Marcus? Some have argued yes. And Marker has said, on a more matter of fact level, I could tell you that the film intended to be, and is nothing more than, a home movie. I really think that my main talent has been to find people to pay for my home movies. What really then is the difference between Marker and the historian? Both work with forms. Marker has his own creative subject and memory. The historian, the film of a war, a movement, a people. Both, all, have boundaries that shift and change, that are open to interpretation and reinterpretation, that are carried with memory into the future for a reason. The form has a history which constrains and suggests. The form is objective. The history of philosophy has a form. The history of war has a form. The history of democracy has a form. The museum and the gallery have a form. The history documentary has a form. The content, that which fits the shape of the form, has some wiggle room, some overflow, like the flora and fauna that congregates in and around the shape of the pond. What is this? No gatekeepers. No peer review. No expensive equipment. A tradition of difference bestowed upon us by a lady at court. Sounds like a fucking perfume advert. Did what we all... <laughs>